Welcome back to Around the Table with Stacey Smith. We're discussing politics. Joe, I'm going to ask you this question. The political ads uh, right now are nonstop on television. But haven't most people already made up their minds? I, I don't think in, in this race, uh, in, in terms of the United States Senate race, which is the hot race of, of this campaign nationally, as you had stated earlier, um, you know, I, I think there's still a lot of undecided voters out there, but it's not what you think. It's not, it's not, do I vote for Oz or do I vote for Fetterman? It's, do I vote in, for anybody in the United States Senate race? I think there are people that will just uh, skip that vote altogether because they find neither candidate satisfactory. So uh, I, I think there are a lot of undecided voters out there. You know, the, up until a few weeks ago, I was still thinking about writing in my barber for the United States Senate. Uh, uh, but uh, um, I finally decided to do what Charlie Cook said. Charlie Cook said that it's no longer about individuals in his political newsletter. He says it's about Jersey. So you're voting for the red Jersey or the blue Jersey, and I'll be voting for the blue Jersey. Joe, you told me you were going to write me in. <laughs> <laughs> That, that being the case, I, I agree. Governor, I, I have voted for Republicans in the past, and I, I would count you in that, that select group. Oh, thank you. I, I agree with Joe. I think that there are a lot of people who have made up their mind that ha haven't decided to vote yet, whether they're going to vote. Maybe there should be a category of none of the above uh, on the ballot, but that's not there. Um, but we also haven't considered what I think is a growing phenomenon is the independent voter. Uh, there are more independents now than there were four years ago, 10 years ago when I was running uh, than ever before. And I don't know that they're getting polled the same way that Republicans and Democrats who are what we call four or three or two year voters uh, are getting polled. So I think there's an unknown out there that if I was a pollster, I'd be trying to figure out how do I tap into that independent vote? Jimmy, you want to have any comments on it? Well, uh, I think that, again, like to the last question, uh, how many uh, how many undecideds are there? Uh, hard to say. There's a variable I think we should talk about in particular with the U.S. Senate race uh, on this issue. And all eyes on the nation, now, I know we're going to get to this, are on the U.S. Senate race, including these spooky, scary eyes behind me for our Halloween decorations. But... Let's look at the variable of the um, non-affiliated candidates that are in the U.S. Senate race and what effect they may have. So, you know, that's another factor in addition to what the governor said about independent uh, voters not maybe being polled properly. Let's not forget that, that those non-affiliates, I think, cost the Democrats that seat. Uh, that was enough uh, to keep, to, to allow Senator Toomey win, to win in the past. So that may be a factor uh, that we should talk about moving forward as well. But it's it's just speculative at this point. Yeah, in Pennsylvania, listen, the reason we're still running ads, the reason they'll run them on election day is, is most big elections in Pennsylvania uh, end up with a one or two three-point margin. Uh, they're, most of the time, they're very competitive. And, and the reality is for, for, for Pennsylvanians, we are split. And regardless of the registration, there's probably around 45% on both sides that have long made their decision up already. So there is that 10%, and that 10% determines who wins by two or three points. So it's worth every nickel, and unfortunately, every $10 million and the tens of millions of dollars that are going to be spent in this, this final three weeks because the, the, the undecideds and those independents that the governor talked about, a lot of those undecideds are independents will determine the next senator and the next governor of the Keystone State. I guess where I was kind of going with this also, the question is, is that we're seeing the same ads, you know, oh. time after time after time, uh, maybe a different approach to it, but the same concept of, of tearing down the, the opponent for whatever well, reason by they now, might have. Well, by now, Stacey, they're doing internal polling almost daily. So they know what, what ads right. are, are helping and what ads are hurting. But and if you're seeing a lot of the same ad, it's because it's having an effect on their internal poll. That's exactly right, Keith. That's exactly right. That's the micro-targeting. That's the micro-data that the GOP candidates and the Democratic candidates and the coordinated campaigns, and, and the, that's the micro-data. That's the micro-targeting, talking to the campaigns, telling them what's working and what isn't. And so it may look redundant to you or me or to us uh, because you know, we've seen it again and again. But 
we are most likely not the target of those commercials. They know what they're doing. I saw that microdata work with Barack Obama. They told me in June of 2012 where they were going to hit and how they were going to hit in the Cleveland suburbs because there was a specific demographic they were looking for with an ad that for us would have, we would have questioned the motive or the intent behind it. But it hit the mark it was intended to hit and they won that demographic. So what we're seeing is there's mythology, there's mythology, uh, methodology to this madness that we're looking at right now. Yeah. Keith is absolutely right. They know what they're doing. Plus, these campaigns have too much money, uh, and 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 you're and that's why it's 24 hours a day. You know, it's it's door to door on these television ads, and and the stakes are just so high. That all this national money is pouring into Pennsylvania. Well, you, Joe, Joe, let me add though too, for the viewers. A lot of those ads that they're seeing aren't necessarily a uh, Fetterman ad paid for by a Fetterman campaign or an Oz ad paid for by the Oz campaign. The national parties and the senatorial campaign committees, they're putting money into this too. And that's why you, you can't go between uh, commercial segments without seeing at least six commercials for different campaigns. I have this question related to this as well. Let's just say then, as as uh, Jim and Keith alluded to, that there's this micro data that is coming in. What if the candidate doesn't like that uh, approach that, that they're being urged to take as far as campaign ads? Does that ever happen, or do they just decide to go right along with whatever the advice is? You know, the law the law is that with the super PACs that there's not even to be any coordination at all. Right. Now, we all sort of scoff at that, I think. Uh, but that is the law. There's to be no coordination. So you don't have any control. Uh, uh, actually over what these groups, what these super PACs uh, put out in the public domain. If it's coming from a super PAC, right. I mean, the candidate, there's nothing a candidate can do or say uh, theoretically and, and as it should be on that. But if it's coming from within the campaign, a candidate can say, no, I don't want to do that. And in theory, the candidate should be the one with the final say on whether you press send or press delete. I mean, look at the McCain race against uh, Barack Obama, when they had they had some hit pieces they wanted to put out, and Senator McCain said, "Absolutely not, do not do it." Um, so yeah, the candidate can say no if the candidate chooses to. Let me make this observation too. Um, probably goes without saying, I have yet to see in the last three weeks a positive ad from a candidate about what they want to do, and the reason is we all know anybody who's been involved in campaigns knows that it's the negative ads, unfortunately. That move numbers. I hear a lot of my friends, I hate negative ads. So do I. But they move the numbers that we've been talking about. And, 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 and fundraising takes time for candidates. It's a lot of time and a lot of effort put into fundraising. So if you're a competitive candidate, you're well aware that the national money comes in late. So you spend a lot of the largesse of your bankroll early, allow that national money to come in. And that's when you're pressing the flesh doing more events, getting out to, to, to meet voters and doing the things that win elections because you don't have that luxury to do it before because you needed to put ads on. The national money kicks in in a way that allow you to do much more of a retail campaign in the last three weeks. Stacy, can I just shift this a little bit because I think it's interesting is that the Mastriano campaign is not doing any of this. He has a, it's almost a silent campaign as far as I'm concerned. Uh, he's on social media. I'm not included in his social media. I don't see any of his um, media work. I'm not sure anybody here at this table sees it. And it's a campaign unlike any other. And it'll be interesting to see what those results are, because I will tell you, uh, Mr. Shapiro is out doing a normal campaign. He has more commercials. He might put, be putting more commercials on than the uh, senatorial candidates are. But he's also out making the earned media stops. He's in Erie. He's in Philadelphia. He's in uh, Lancaster. He's out there doing it. You don't hear anything about Mr. Mr. Mastriano. I will. I will say that. Out. I will say that he has started to put ads on television now, and he okay. talks about his military service and uh, oh, how. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, so that he has started to do that. We have to take a break. We'll be back in just a moment. <laughs> 